So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming back to our monthly seminar series. Um, and thanks to all the technologies and the help from our communications team that helps us do this every week. Um, we've been trying to, to uh, keep our seminars topical to the COVID crisis. Um, though I think if this goes on much longer, we might want to actually go back to discussing other issues urban as well. But uh, this time we're going to talk about margins and confinements and communities that are in distress uh, during the COVID crisis in Indian cities with a comparison of two very different sites um, uh, in uh, near Pondicherry and uh, in, in Delhi. And I'd like to welcome uh, two geographers to our seminar this time. Uh, presenting together, uh, which is really nice in a socially distanced world to see two people sitting in the same office and presenting and not on <laughs> screens. Um, so <laughs> they're presenting from Pondicherry. Welcome uh, Remy and Anthony and thank you very much uh, for sharing with us your recent work. Um, and uh, I'm going to hand over to you uh, right away uh, for your presentation. You know the rules, you have 45 minutes to talk and then we take questions, but just before, uh, before I hand over for everyone who's listening in, uh, if you have clarificatory questions, just type them in the, in the chat window and I'll try to find a way to intervene because all your, um, you're all on video and audio off for the duration of the presentation. Um, once they finish presenting, then, uh, and if we are not like a ridiculously uh, large crowd, we'll uh, use the raise hand option to take questions so that you can actually interface with, with the speakers. But we'll, ha we'll have that interface after the presentation is done. So I'm going to hand over to them and please feel free to use the chat window. It's open so everybody can read chats that are publicly sent and you can also have a conversation on the chat window finally, uh, if, if you want. Uh, I'm handing over to both of you. Thank you very much once again for being here with us. Thank you very much, Mukta, for this kind introduction. So I would share the screen just right now because we have a PowerPoint. Uh, share. Now, hopefully you should see our uh, PowerPoint. Is it okay? Yeah, we can. <clears throat> okay, so thank you very much, Mukta, for this kind introduction. Uh, before, before. Do you want to uh, uh, maximize, I mean, let's like, show full screen on your PowerPoint? Because I can see the other slides on the left side right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like that? Yeah, please go. Okay. Uh, okay, so before, thank you very much, Mokta, for this kind introduction. So before anything, we would like to begin our presentation by coming back to the main slogan of the epidemic. Ah, this is not functioning. Okay, which is um, stay safe, stay at home. This slogan has been translated in practice through a lockdown strategy, which has been applied in a good number of countries uh, to so-called flatten the curve and to protect the population. Basically, it means that you have to stay at home, stay safe, and you have to wait for the situation to improve. Just simply wait at home. But the question here is, what does it mean to stay at home when your home is actually in a slum or a precarious settlement or a camp? What does it mean to stay at home and stay safe when you are living in the margins of the society? As Ajay was saying, what about containment as a health protection for populations that are already experiencing a first kind of containment? So if you look at this photograph, the one photo of Mumbai by Johnny Miller, you will agree with me by saying that it is not at all the same thing if you are staying at home on the left part of the photograph in middle class uh, settlement, rather than staying on the right side of the photograph in slums. Despite some difficulties that we have all been through these last two months, it's not at all the same thing to be confined at home and stay safe when you are toilet, food delivery, internet connection, perhaps even a Netflix account, rather than being locked up with all your family in one single tiny catcher house under more than 40 degrees with only few rupees left to feed your family. 
So basically, we can say that we are all in the same storm, but we are not in the same boat. The lockdown highlights some structural inequalities that were pre-existing the crisis, and these inequalities call into the question of the uniform, uniformity sorry, of the response, which do not make any difference between poor settlement and rich settlement. So the main hypothesis of our work is that in an unequal world, one uniform solution cannot fit heterogeneous situation without any adaptation. And if it is not the case, if there is no real account of these pre-existing inequalities, then one uniform solution, like a total lockdown, like it has been implemented in India, can only lead to reinforce these inequalities. So the question was, what does it mean to be confined in the margins? So for this, as Muka was saying, uh, we are comparing two situations. <coughs> the first one is in Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-Kizu-
and 674 Sri Lankan Tamils living in 107 camps distributed across Tamil Nadu, with an additional, additional estimated population of more than 35,000 people living outside the camp. <clears throat> the majority of Tamil Nadu's population shares with the Tamils of Sri Lanka both a linguistic, religious, and historical or mythological heritage and a political commitment to Tamil identity. Many Sri Lankans believed that the displacement would be only temporary and will end when the violence and conflict did. The conflict was officially ended in May 2009. Over time, however, this hope gave way to a sense of Poland's time, characterized by a long wait. In the end, many refugees resigned themselves to accepting a normalization of the temporary, which proved to be a strain in coping with the lockdown. In addition, the encampment conditions of Sri Lankans have evolved in response to the security situation. While initially, the attitude towards them of the government of New Delhi and Tamil Nadu was benevolent, the situation changed after the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi on the 21st May 1991. The first, the fear story of importing Tamil separatism into India immediately led to an intensification of the encampment policy and the setting up of repatriation operations, not always on a basis, on a voluntary basis. I just want to precise something. I just want to precise that it is difficult to make sense of the concept of refugees in India. India is not a signatory state of the 1951 Geneva Convention or the 1967 Additional Protocol. This means that the main part of international law regarding refugees does not apply to India. Also, there is no refugee category in domestic law, which means that, from a legal standpoint, refugees in India are considered as mere foreigners. This being said, the refugee reality in India is more complex than that. Pieces of international law regarding refugees do apply to India, making it difficult for Indian authorities to consider refugees simply as foreigners. This legal situation is rendered more complicated by the fact that India, despite having no legal category refugee, recognizes de facto refugees. So the Sri Lankan Tamil refugees are de facto refugees, they are not de jure refugees. <clears throat> I'm going now to focus on Kilkutupatu refugee camp. So the Kilkutupatu refugee camp is located at 20 kilometers north of Pondicherry, along the East Coast Road. The camp is located between two hotels, the Ocean Pre, that you can see on the, to the north, and the Dune to the south, and is home to nearly 450 families. So this is uh, the camp in this part. <clears throat> For a total of 1,726 Sri Lankans, the vast majority of them were arrived in the 80s and the 90s, and they are coming from Manar Island. The camp is located in the state of Tamil Nadu, but is located on the border with the Union territory of Pondicherry, nearby the Czech post, which has the effect of reinforcing the police presence. Within the camp, individual housing is organized according to an autonormal plan. The alleys are narrow, made of unpaved earth. Electricity and water are provided free of charge by the government. The shelters are simple, built of concrete, including the floor and with a tin roof. Their size is standardized, a square of 10 feet on each side. But as refugees already stated in 2014, generally speaking, in the camp, it is 40% government aid and constraint and 60% private initiatives. In that way, the camp should be analyzed within the framework of ambiguity, understood as a condition of simultaneous exclusion and inclusion. The refugee camp is more than just a humanitarian space of physical relief and welfare, more than a space of exception and anticipated biopolitical control. The camp is a space of multiple ambiguities and subjectivities in sum up an assemblage. <clears throat> While movement outside the camp is officially all under control and requires multiple permits in normal times, Refugees find employment outside the camp, mainly in physical and low-skilled jobs as painters, carpenters, or builders. They are also working seasonal jobs, like working for the fishing company during the fishing season from June to October. From June to October, the fishing harbor of Pondicherry is a very important place for them. More than 1,000 Sri Lankan Tamis are working in the fishing harbor during the fishing season. The Sri Lankan refugees are not officially allowed to work. This does not mean that they do not work, but that they will only get jobs that Indians do not want for themselves, or when they find the same jobs, they will not be able to negotiate a full salary. In that way, the practices of refugees in the camp must be understood as a form of political agency, not the silent expressions of bare life. Anybody want to continue? No, no, I think it's okay, yeah. <clears throat> 
It means that in normal time, the limits of Kilfutu Patouf camp are porous, allowing goods, people, and ideas to move in and out the camp. Despite these everyday transgressions of the limit of the camp, the perimeter remains an important defining characteristic and shapes the life of those who remain inside. I should precise that the camp is not, the Kilfutu Patouf camp is not surrounded by barbed wire or walls. This is an open camp. So the separation between inside and outside, the separation between insiders and outsiders is more discursive than material, is more symbolic than physical. Then as pointed by Simon Turner, living inside a refugee camp, however invisible the line between the camp and its surroundings, and despite ongoing contact between the inside and the outside, marks one's life and defines one's position, a position that is simultaneously excluded from and including into our society, excluding spatially and legally while simultaneously being defined and contained by the surrounding society. So if the city offers revenue during the lockdown, there is a scarcity to find work, so no work, no money. Nevertheless, lockdown undermines these ordinary acts of resistance and tests the networks of sociability without, however, undermining them too drastically. It has also resulted in the strengthening of police presence around and in the camp. Staying at home, is difficult for the refugees. It condemns them to dipping into their savings. Mugandan, uh, you can uh, see uh, in the slide, Mugandan, thanks to the networks he has gradually built up, is the only one in the Kilbutu Club to enjoy his total freedom of movement and one of the few to have been able to keep his job because he is working to repair the house of the mother of an important MLA in Pondicherry. Mugandan was able to obtain a pass that allows him to easily cross all check posts between the camps in Tamil Nadu and the construction sites in Pondicherry. Anthony, another refugee, who with his wife Vita owns one of the few shops in the camp, has not been so lucky. He nevertheless won, under cover of a regular fruit and vegetable contribution to the police, permission to go to the market in Pondicherry to restock his supplies. But sales in his stall are on credit basis, and the purchase of food is a drain on his savings. Like the other refugees, he is worried about the coming weeks. What our interviews reveal is also a peculiarity of this segment of the population that has substantial savings. The situations encountered in the camp are certainly less difficult than in Anuman Mandir, but still precarious, unstable, and uncertain. As Sunam told me, because we are Sri Lankan refugees, we are not Indian citizens, and we don't have voting cards, people involved in politics are not worried about us. In the neighborhoods next to our camp, the MLA came to give rice, sugar, oil. No one comes here. But what saves us are our savings. So no work, no money, but there is a relatively well-functioning welfare state for the Sri Lankan refugees who are established in the camp. Actually, the Sri Lankans are considered to be the group of refugees most favorably treated by the Indian authorities, like the Tibetan refugees. They have been widely accepted by India and also registered with authorities they receive financial assistance and food at subsidized prices. All the refugees living in Kilputubudu camp have an Adar card and a ration card. This gives them access to the PDS. All families receive 20 kg of rice per month, free of cost. Each family can buy additional rice within the limits of their rights at the price of 44 pesa per kg. They also receive oil and sugar. And as mentioned visually in Gam in this uh, interview, they receive fund from the government, 1,000 rupees per month for the adult, 400 rupees for people below 12 years old, 750 for people <coughs> above 12 years old. So as mentioned, Vishwalingam, aside from food, we have no other expenses than 3,250 rupees is enough for the four of us. It seems that the situation there is much less catastrophic than in Anuman Mandir, even so the residents are not Indian citizens. We can see here how the refugee label is a tangible representation of policies and programs, which in our case have become over the years particularly benevolent towards Sri Lankan Tamils in the camps. There is a paradoxical idea that refugees may be privileged over citizens, most notably the urban poor. We can suggest that for marginalized populations, Refugee status can operate as a more effective protective layer than legal citizenship. Refugee status becomes a symbolic and interpretive resource used to negotiate the structural realities of the welfare state. That's why, as Elvin told me in 2015, I don't want to become an Indian citizen. To accept Indian citizenship means to refuse assistance from the government of Tamil Nadu. What will be our future without this assistance? But, <clears throat> 
So, but there may be a trade-off with this welfare state, as Sunam suggests in this interview. We are only allowed to be away from COM for two hours a day. We have to sign the register. COM supervisor is very strict on this point. All our movements are scrupulously noted and recorded on this register. At the beginning of the lockdown, one person of the COM did not respect this new rule and only came back in the evening. The COM supervisor made a report asking for the cancellation of the financial aid from the government for one month, as well as their ration of rice and other provisions to which they are entitled as a ration shop. He also locked the door of his house with all the occupants inside and asked all the camp residents not to speak to them for three days or face similar punishment. So that was the situation in uh, Republica. What does it mean to stay home and face them when you are face safe when you are in the storm? So this image has been taken in Anuman Mandir. Anuman Mandir is one of that uh, uh, slum in India. In India, according to the census of 2011, you have like 13.7 million of households. In Delhi, 367,000 households are living in slum. But if you take the National Statistical Survey, which lies on a different definition, then these figures can rise until 1.02 million of households living in one of these 6,363 slums. So living condition in slums are not as good as the living condition in the refugee camp. The infant mortality is 46 per thousand, and 56% of the children are obliged to defecate in the open. This was before uh, Swatch Barat Abiyan. Believe me, the situation, unfortunately, has not drastically changed after. This is still the situation. And one Mandir, you see small children defecating in the open. So Anuman Mandir, as I told at the beginning of the presentation, is one of these slums in the middle of South Delhi, in Arkepura. And it's one of these 757 DG cluster uh, contabilized by the Delhi Urban Shelter Board. The definition of a DG cluster, for those who are not aware, basically means that uh, it's a settlement which is illegally occupying the public land, as it is the case uh, of Anuman Mandir. So, on this area, you, you can see Anuman Mandir just in front of Arkepuram police station. So, the settlement had begun in 1988. It was built on the land which belonged to the Delhi jail board, and it's built along a drain. So, you can see uh, again, the drain on the picture below. So people are living just next to the drain <coughs> illegally. The settlement is 50% Kacha, 50% Paka. Since the uh, Manmi Party came into power two years back, you have like more and more Paka houses. Um, there is a minimum of 373 family. I say a minimum because this doesn't take into account all the rental uh, houses, which is difficult to enumerate. And most of the community are coming from UP, Aligarh, mostly Bijnor, uh, Raibareli, Agra, Lucknow. Also people are coming from Bengal, Bihar, and Rajasthan. The important community is mostly LC, and they are involved in two ways speaking. So you can see on the photograph along the drain all these Kabarivala, you know, working um, with the waste. And so, so that's why I was interested into that settlement few years back when I began to work on it. And the majority is OBC, uh, with mostly uh, Dimar, Seifi, Abbasi, and Muslim. So basically, it's a settlement which is spatially and socially already relegated to the margin. So where is the home of the slum dwellers? Why do these people did not go back to, like all the migrants, to the village when the lockdown has begun? Um, because the answer to this question is very simple. Because for slum, what we think is slum is an administrative category, which is a political construct. For these people, for those who have been living despite the problems of salubrity, despite the problems of poverty, the slum remains, above all, a home for its inhabitants. So you can see 
the picture on the left side, it's and it looks like a village. It's actually in Anuman Mandir, it's where they do wash uh, the, the clothes. It looks like a home, but it is a home for these people. Are, it's mostly families who are living in the slum. It's not single main migrants uh, who are living just temporarily in a camp for some construction work in the building. And then after the construction is done, after six months, they go back to the village. This is not the case. The slum exists since 1988. It's a permanent slum and family who are residing here. Most of them are living here permanently. So as Sanjana is saying, why she has not gone back after the, the lockdown has been declared by the prime minister, our life is here. My husband works here as a rickshaw driver so that our children have a better life than ours. It is for them that we are here. The education system is good in Delhi. We moved to Ravidas camp, it's another slum across the street. After I got married, and we finally moved here in Anuman Mandir, back to Assam. But this is our home here anyway. I am six months pregnant. The question doesn't even arise for that home. So for these inhabitants, uh, they did not go back at the beginning of the lockdown because as for the refugee camp, the cities of revenue and hope. The city offer an income. So it's not as much as money as in the refugee camp. It's between 7,000 and 15,000 as an average. And you have people earning much more and you have people earning much less. It's mostly all these small invisible and disregard jobs of everyday life that people didn't want to lose by going back to the village. You have informal waste collectors who want to keep an access to the neighborhood where they do collect uh, waste house to house uh, ways. You have domestic helpers that doesn't want to lose the few hours they are doing in this home, in this house. You have guardians of colonies, rich drivers, small craftsmen, carpenters, locksmiths, uh, and maybe some of them have some loan to repay. I mean, they cannot go like that. All of them, like in the refugee camp, are struggling to establish themselves in the city. And for this family, the preservation of their work, however insignificant it may, it may seem to some, is of crucial importance. They were thinking that the lockdown would be temporary. It was supposed to be 21 days. And they were thinking that after these 21 days of struggle, they could go back to normal life. And so in that case, living is losing. So they didn't want to lose their job. They didn't want to lose their dreams. They didn't want to lose their hope. Living was not seen as a, via, uh, as a viable option. I was, I'm saying was not because after two months of lockdown now, people begin to lose hope, you know? But that was not the case two months back. So like, for example, um, uh, Om Prakash was saying, no, we do not own any land in the village in UP, neither my father nor my grandfather. In the village, I didn't even have enough money to dress the children properly. We try to go back every year, which is important, but it is expensive. And we have to make sure that we are replaced at work here in Delhi while we are away. Because once they go back to one month, they want to find their, their work. So there is no point in living in a hurry. I called my parents and they told me it's better to stay in Delhi. The government should have given two days of preparation for those who can afford to live. So like in the refugee camp, after the lockdown, then you don't have work anymore. So you don't have money, you don't have food. You find the same narrative everywhere in all the interviews. I have no job, for example, uh, Surrender Kumar is saying, I have no job, I have no money, I have no food, I have no gas, I have no tin. The labor shock is closed. I know the virus is dangerous, but if I don't find money soon, my family will go and do. That's the, the, the main difference uh, during the lockdown with the refugee camp is that the PDS system was not working uh, very well. You got some problem of logistics due to the lack of manpower. Some fair price shops were not getting the food. It was closed. Some of them were um, opening one day. It was closed the second day. But the main problem that you are all aware is the same problem with the migrants is the non-portability of rice because a lot of people got who are eligible, of course, for the PDS system, uh, were not up to date in the system and they were registered in the village. 
So they have not done all the process of, you know, updating their car, their car, and so they were not eligible to it. So hopefully the finance minister has said that uh, one nation, one ration car scheme should be ready soon, but they were also telling that last year and don't know when it could be done. And for the people who were eligible for the ration uh, card in Delhi, you have also a lot of administrative issue. For example, this is one of the issues among many. My nursing was explaining that I used to have a ration card, but it doesn't work anymore. My jungi is at number one, 170, but on the new cards, I marked 171. I didn't notice at the time. I was able to get the food ration for three, four months before I was forbidden. I tried to get it rectified, but it was a waste of time, so I gave up. I do have a Jandan account, but nothing was paid into it. Actually, some people did receive these 500 rupees that the government was claiming at the beginning of the lockdown. And my there is finishing about, uh, I don't know the official program. Everything is provided for those who can read, but not for the others. So the government daily has done a welcome move with a temporary ration card since the PDS from, uh, was not really up to date for everybody. So it's for these people needed to register on a website online. They got an e-coupon and they could get some ration. But the big problem when you're living in a slum is that first the registration process remains difficult because of lack of awareness. And second, you don't have internet data connection and it is expensive to register, um, you know, sorry, to get um, data connection, internet data in your phone to get registered. If you succeed to do it, then you get this e-coupon that allow you to go to not the fair trade shop, but the uh, relief center where you can get some uh, food. But here also it was the same problem. The people have been asked to go back uh, the day after and go back again and go back again. And, and finally, when they got something, the quantity was too small and people begin to talk about humiliation. They felt that, okay, four kg of grains and one kg of rice, and it's humiliating, I won't be able to survive on that. So people begin to talk, this was after the first, ex uh, the first extension of the lockdown, mid April, they were talking about, you know, dignity. One solution was to get food at the community kitchen. And here also people were reluctant to go to get their hot meal at the community kitchen. Like Sanjana was explaining, I, I don't go there in the community kitchen because there are too many people and not all of them are fair. It is dangerous for the virus. And then I'm afraid of being hurt in the crowd. To save 10 rupees of food, I would have to risk spending 1,000 rupees in the hospital. So basically people in the slum slowly, slowly are obliged to cut in every day and save on everything. Sanjana, the same woman, is explaining that my husband borrowed 50 rupees to buy meat for my two children, one and three years old. But who will be able to lend him every day? We eat less and less, first the children and then us. Before, my, before the lockdown, my husband was working. He would bring me mango juice, fruits, vegetables, but that's all over now. And we just sold one on our phone, the button phone for 1500 rupees to enable because the most important thing in life is to feed the children but we have nothing else to sell now i don't know what would happen next so most of the people actually are entering in debt that's the case in the slum so they borrow money to um, so for like radiation i just borrowed two thousand rupees at two percent of interest or they ask in advance uh, to their uh, uh, for example, like, uh, sorry, Mr. Ijvar has asked Babu Wan Kabarivala to give him an advance of 2,000 rupees. So all this, they will have to repay later on. So after the lockdown will period will be over, these people are, will have to work just to repay their debt. So because the welfare state is not functioning properly, people uh, rely on uh, civil organization as much as they, uh, they can. And here also civil organization and you are exhausted. So I have put picture of Chintan, Spandan, which are, uh, so Chintan, the question is, you know, to whom the help should be given. You have to identify the people you want to help. Chintan is working only with Tabarivala. So they have to know, you know, to make to an endless process otherwise. You have to give to everybody because people in, in needs keeps increasing. Spandan, for example, in working mostly in Bopura slum only. 
So to whom is the ethical question that the NGO are doing? And how? Because it's a lockdown, so mobility is constrained. Uh, you don't have as much as human resources. People are afraid to get the virus. They are doing food distribution. You have financial constraints, of course. And after two months of lockdown, you have an increasing number of needy families and a risk of riot during food distribution. So, so this video has been taken uh, after the first extension of the lockdown in Anuman Mandir. It's Chintan who was trying to uh, distribute food. Uh, they got a list of 50 families without ration cards to Barivala, to whom they should uh, give the food. But people were panicking and there was like 1,000 people on the day of the distribution. So of course, Chintan workers could not do their job. They distributed seven Russian kits and then they left because they could not work anymore in Anuman Mandir because of this you know, tension which was arising right after the first extension. So some NGO have been uh, filling a PL, ordering the government you know, to, to do its job. And so like the Delhi Roj Roti Adhikar Abiyan and one month after, and nothing has really been done and the e-coupon system is not functioning and people are still starving. People are in hunger still like two months after the, the lockdown. So this was just to give you an overview of the two different situation in Anuman Mandir and, uh, and in uh, Kilputu Kil So now with it, we have still some time left, I think, yes. <coughs> So um, what about respecting protective measures when you are living in the margin? The Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has issued a lot of uh, protective measures. You know, you should, you should wear a mask and social distancing and all this. But what does it mean when you are actually living in the margins? Because we have the feeling, Anthony and me, that and it is not possible to put a lockdown with such kind of protective measures. We, in, in a slum, I mean, it's not possible to implement that kind of protective measures. So wearing masks, so it should be the N95 mask, of course limited to the ability to pay of the inhabitants. So you have a picture here of Anuman Mandir during, the, it was the second week of the lockdown. So you see people um, with bucket, you see people with, with under uh, chief on the face. So, Surinder Kumar is explaining, how could we buy masks without money? My wife just put a dupatta in front of her face to protect herself when she goes to fill the water early in the morning before it gets too crowded. There are about a dozen families in the same water point. So we make sure we don't all go at the same time. She doesn't wash her stuff every day and I don't wash my underkeep either every day. But we are careful to wash well our hands before eating. At first, we were even washing in, to, in hot water with Dettol, but now we are saving LPG. It's the same problem in the Kizu Tupatu camp. We can't afford to buy disposable mask. It's, a way to, it's way too expensive to do it right. We would have to spend more than 400 rupees a day for the whole family. So we just use scarves and cloth masks. We both have each other. This allow us to rotate. We wash them by boiling water to which we add detol. So the same kind of strategy for people who cannot afford to wear masks. What about washing hands? So in, in India, you have still 20% of uh, households in uh, urban India which still lacks water access. And for them, of, uh, obviously, oops, sorry. For them, obviously, the situation will be uh, complicated. <laughs> so in Anuman Mandir, as I told before on the previous slide, we don't have individual connection and family have to share this um, to approximately 20 cubic taps available within the camp, so which means like 10 to 20 families per water pump. In the camp, the situation is totally different. The situation is much better because uh, step by step, the camp dwellers have improved their situation and improved their life. And 70% of the people have their own taps inside their homes. So the water tank are rarely used in the camp. And the situation is uh, 
similarly the same in all the camps in Tamil Nadu. So in terms of washing hands, it's easier in the camp rather than in a slum. Uh, so now is that the most paradoxal? I'm talking about social distancing while you are in India. What does it mean social distancing when you are living in the margins in India? So just to remind you, in 2011, according to the census, 35% of households in India live in one single room. In Anuman Mandir, as well as in the camp, average is like four to five members, so family size, in one room of nine square meters. So the, the spatial distancing, I do not say social distancing, the physical distancing is totally impossible inside the family. And it's also impossible in overcrowded and slum and uh, maybe also in refugee yeah, camp exactly. at one point. It is also. Because in Anuman Mandir, you have like, so it's 2.2 hectares, and you have approximately 1,500 people living in the slum. So the density is like 60,000 inhabitants per kilometer area. So obviously, spatial distancing is impossible in the neighborhood. Uh, the refugee camp is a little bit better, but still, the density is very high as well. <coughs> but what the lockdown has, has the effect of the lockdown is about social distancing with the outside, which has been reinforced by the caste system, which has been reinforced by the class system, which has been reinforced by the refugee statute. So there is a much higher social distancing from the middle class neighborhood, which of course existed before the crisis, and it has been reinforced. And the physical violence used by the police to actually repress those who dare to venture outside the camp of the slum is the main reason for the respect of the confinement. For these inhabitants, the fear of the lucky is even more than the fear of the virus. That's why they stay invisible in the slum. So we come to the conclusion. So basically our guided interview reveals that the lockdown just I like some pre-existing inequality. It's, it's, uh, yes. yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, there is an insufficient access to water and sanitation. There is uh, too much density overcrowded. Of course, there is a lack of social protection, which directly endangers the life of family who have no means of subsistence with the lockdown. So it's an evidence, but it has been really violently reinforced by the lockdown. Then it leads us to think about rights of the city for these inhabitants in the margin. The lockdowns has revealed a lack of basic rights, like access to water, proper household in the margin of the city. As it is, the lockdown, without acknowledging the existing inequality, the lockdown is simply denying the right of the urban poor to live in the city. How come someone can implement a strategy like this without thinking that it will be impossible, unbearable for all the urban poor? The crisis highlights that there are rights in the city understood it, uh, uh, sorry, rights in the city understood here uh, how, as a reformist uh, approach of the Lefebvrean Lefe concept. Um, is not, is not at all respected. The lockdown is not protecting the life of the poor. The lockdown, as it is implemented, may protect the life of the rich against the virus by sacrificing the poor. What the crisis really reveals, and this lockdown has been, and it's really a lie, this is our indifference to the urban poor. And this is not at all specific to India, of course. But this is really a stringent um, effect of the lockdown. So as long as the city is not made livable for the livable for the urban poor with basic rights which are not yet fulfilled, the standard application of the lockdown is completely denying the rights to the city. And it's very sad because this is a political issue. All these tragedies are avoidable, like, you know, this is not a financial or technical problem. And the comparison between Anuman Mandir and the refugee camp in uh, in Pondicherry, and does have all the effective tools and means necessary to meet the basic needs of precarious population. The PDS could be universalized 
water access would be uh, uh, universalized to this uh, area since long it should have been done so in the Kizu Tupatu camp, government aid works despite the crisis thanks to better institutional recognition of the de facto and not de jure statue of refugee, which has long allowed them to benefit from monthly food distribution and a modest financial support. So, and somehow, Italy has had the difficulties linked to the lockdown. But in Anuman Mandir, it's not at all the case. The suffering of the inhabitants have been accentuated by the administrative problems which makes them ineligible for the aid. And the lockdown reveals a lack of rights through the city. In both cases, for the refugees and for the slum dwellers, the mobility is linked to employment, generate new forms of cohabitation by being deployed in the interstices of the city, in the margins of the city, or in the spaces on the fronts of urbanization. These mobilities generate co-presence, and these places invested by these populations that are thought to be marginalized takes on the appearance of a space of transaction where the visibility of these people depends on their materiality and therefore on their corporeality. This visibility makes it possible to claim a right and to make it concrete in the urban space. Through these ways of taking place, it is a question of asserting a right through the city, understood as a capacity to formulate in public space a political demand in terms of rights more than a revolutionary emancipation program. So the lockdown also is a way to rethink citizenship in the margins. The camp and the slam constitute the real space where citizenship can be arbitrarily questioned, where individuals are translated into simple biopolitical bodies that can be beaten with LATI, an adjustment viable allowing the economy to be competitive. In these times of pandemic, more than the camp, slums as a political technology or as a device or as a dispositive, according to Foucault, is precisely the way in which this objectivation is made operational and can be carried to extreme manifestations. More than humanitarian government, more than moral sentiments, these testimonies, these interviews that we have collected call for justice. They also denounce solutions coming from elsewhere, imposed without discernment and anticipation, and chosen according to multiple interests that make these population govern targets. The fact remains that all these marginalized people demand the right to have their essential rights respected and appealed. Refugees from Kilkutupatu camp search for an optimal in-betweenness. What they see is a possibility of combining the advantages of being a refugee, which have increased over the years, with the advantages of being a citizen. They ask for a merging of substantive refugees and substantive citizenship. So the situation is totally different from this point regarding to Anuman Mandia. Thank you for your attention. So maybe one more about this photograph. This is a picture of uh, Anthony. Sorry, um, because uh, I'm Anthony. Our research assistant is Anthony, and this is Anthony, which is a refugee, a yeah. Sri Lankan refugee, who was settled in Kilkutupatu camp and is coming from uh, Puducherry, where he bought some uh, vegetables and fruits to uh, for his shop in the camp. Thank you. Thank you so much. There are already a whole bunch of questions uh, on the chat window. So I'm going to sort of try and bunk. Can you close the presentation so we can see you again? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, stop share. Stop share. Uh, okay. So um, there are a few different questions. It's okay. I'll ask them to you, Remy. So I mean, the, I, it's going to be hard for you to scroll up and down the screen. But I think there's one set of questions on the refugees, and after that we'll sort of come to the more uh, to, to, and another set of questions on 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 the nature of civil society, why they're exhausted, that kind of thing. And then there are some methodological. Uh, questions broadly and also some very astute observations and I'll save the chat and send it to you later if you want to look at look at it at leisure uh, but essentially on refugees and I, I guess uh, the, the, the questions are um, what can you dwell a little bit on uh, defining the refugees in India um, what kind of private uh, initiatives have supported them uh, has the government announced any relief or fiscal pact packages for them and uh, you also mentioned that they don't want to become citizens of India so like what is really the advantage in 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 in, in their current status that they see that they so maybe if you can answer the the refugee questions first then we'll move on to to the more comparative ones 
uh, the refugees not want to Okay, to regarding uh, what is the refugee in India, so uh, there is no refugee law in India. And uh, as I said before, India is not a statutory member of uh, all the international convention, but, uh, that, but there is also, there is uh, India, there is no, there, there is no refoulement. It's, it's, quite, it's quite difficult to explain what is a refugee in India in a few words. There is no refugee law, there is no refugee law in India. And the situation is different if you are a Sri Lankan or Tibetan, you are most welcome regarding uh, if you are coming from uh, Afghan, Afghanistan and so on. So step by step, <clears throat> because there is a co-ethnicity between uh, Sri Lankan Tamils and Tamil uh, from Tamil Nadu, they are most welcome compared to other group of refugees, but there are no uh, uniformized refugee law in India. So that's why it's difficult to, do, to say what is a refugee in India. And usually they are under the Foreigners Act of 1946. So, but because they are hosted by the government of Tamil Nadu, they receive some help. So when I say 60% private initiative, that means that state by state, because most of the people arrive in the 80s, 83, 84, 85, they try to manage their lives, they try to improve their life. They receive help from government, but it's not sufficient. So that's why they have to improve their life by their own, uh, own side. So, no, they don't want to take Indian citizenship because they can't to take Indian citizenship. That's why they are in between us, they are not, in that city, they can't go back to Sri Lanka. Some of them want to go back to Sri Lanka because they have some family, but most of them are, were born in uh, the camp in Kilpotopatu. So for those people, it's no, it's, they don't want to go back in Sri Lanka. They don't want to be resettled in another country. They want to stay in India and they apply, they want to become Indian citizenship. Some of the political parties are DMK or ADMK, they want to, to give us some dual citizenship, but it's not possible because if we offer dual citizenship for the Sri Lankan Tamil refugees, maybe we have to give this dual citizenship for other refugees who are settled in Delhi. So the refugees who are settled in Delhi are mandate refugees. So UNHCR is uh, important for the people who are mandate refugees in Delhi, but in uh, Tamil Nadu, UNHCR do not go inside the camp. UNHCR is important only for the repatriation process. And repatriation process is very few now <clears throat> so what are those okay. hmm? Yeah, I, I think I think that kind of covers the questions on refugees. Okay. refugees. I'll move to Remy now, and uh, there's there are some specific questions for Hanuman Camp. Uh, the first is from Marie Ellen, who, who asks about uh, uh, this question about staying or leaving, and whether you asked in uh, mm -hmm. you know interview in your interviews whether they had neighbors or other people in the mm -hmm. camp mm -hmm. who had left, and who were the people who left, and who were the people who stayed. So, so sort of you know, is, is, is there some logic to that? And there's another question which is specific to Hanuman camp, which is on the position of women in the slums and domestic violence and how does that sort of add to the volatility of the situation? So Remy, if you could answer those questions, then we'll move on because I'm trying to do this sort of, so that one of you can answer at a time on these. Yeah. Great job, Mukta. Thank you. So to answer my question, who stays, who leaves? So as I said at the beginning of the presentation, it's mostly family who are in the scrum, but it's not only families. So you have also, you have people who have invested in the scrum. Some of them also have bought their house, I mean the wall of their house, because of course they do not own the, the land. But you have also individuals. You have uh, single men workers. And so at the beginning, right at the beginning of the lockdown, you have few people who left the slum, there were mostly single men workers who got the family in, uh, in the village, in UP. These people left. It was mostly, um, yeah. Now, two months after, because the, we were not discussing about this during the presentation, you have a lot of people who are losing hope and you have even family who are thinking, okay, this is not bearable and unfortunately we need to go back. We need to leave to the village. But it's very difficult because for this you need money and they ask money to buy a train ticket. Uh, some of them are getting stopped at the Gaziabad border and they go, they go back to the slum. So they cannot escape the slum. Basically, who stays, it's very simple. It's family whose home is actually in the slum. Who is living is temporary workers who are here since six months, one day there, and they are going back to the village. Among them, regarding the waste pickers, for example, you have two different, very different categories. 
You have the one who are doing house to house connection, uh, house to house collection, sorry. They don't want to leave because if they leave, they are losing everything. They are losing their access to uh, their territory to collect waste. They are leaving everything. The one who are doing uh, collection in the streets are a different category. These people, they want to leave. They want to go back now. They want to go to the village. They think that there is rock in the village. There is this Enrega scheme. They will be able to find some work in the village. But for them, they are done with the city. So you have different people at the beginning of the lockdown who have decided to leave. And you have different people now, after two months, who lose hope totally and they want to escape of the slum. Can I? Regarding, sorry. Can I? Sorry. No, you weren't done, sorry. I just wanted to add uh, two more questions to you, but you can answer. I thought I'd, uh, I thought you were done. You want to continue before I ask no, them? No, no. Yeah, so no, I think the question that was specific to the Hanuman camp uh, were uh, first um, uh, about um, whether people who, so I'll read it out. It would be uh, uh, what networks of sociability were made available and used uh, mm. Were there people that became more resourceful in the community because of their ability to access online information? So mm. this is one question. And then there was another question about whether there was corruption uh, in, dis in distribution of PDS. Okay. So those are the so two, because about, then I want to move to a more comparative question uh, after that. Yeah. So of course, in this plan, you have a um, few people who arrive as local leaders. You have the products, at the beginning when we were working with the slum, we were trying to establish a list of uh, non-Russian card holders. And here is the role of the local leaders where there is strong. These local products are uh, rising more powerful because there are actually the connection, the broker between the people, the inhabitants, and the MLA or the NGO or me and Goda when we were trying to help. And so, of course, when you have someone who is able to do to register to this e-coupon online, he's doing a great job and people will go to him. I remember after the first extension of the lockdown, when people realized that there was this uh, temporary Russian card available online, we were, so with Godard, my colleague, we are trying to register for them online. Then we found someone in the slum who got this ability, a young guy, uh, 15, 16 years old, I don't remember his name, and he began to feel for many people. And he gained a little bit of power, but you know, respectability from the others. So you have like few people, and the products, local products, are very important uh, of these few people because they get interaction with the MLS, they get interaction with the, with, the, with the NGO. And once the food is coming and it's coming to them, and they have the responsibility to ensure that the distribution is done with the NGO. So they are getting, of course, uh, much more power. Um, about the corruption, so to be honest, this I won't be able to reply. There are already a lot of uh, work which has been done by Frédéric Landy, Girish Kumar, about, you know, problem of PDS. So I rely on interview from the inhabitants and I've not done an interview with the fair price shop, so I don't know, but people, of course, are talking about corruption and are talking about logistics problem, but I won't be able to reply this question, but I guess, unfortunately, that the situation is not new during the lockdown, and the problem which were before the lockdown, and corruption was one of them, are still there, unfortunately, during the lockdown. That's why you have some shops which are closed, and that's why some, you know, some food is not reaching the eligible people. And about the women, so, sorry. And, and regarding corruption uh, with the PDS, uh, According to the last uh, one of the publications of uh, Ritika Kera, uh, she mentioned that the uh, collusion is less, very less in the southern states compared to the northern states. So that's why it was interesting to do also a comparison between uh, <coughs> two field works, one in the south and one in the north. Basically, our respondents in Anuman Mandir were, faced, were facing a lot of problems to access the PDS food, and was, uh, that was not at all the case in South India in the refugee camp at least. And regarding gender issue, so at the beginning, I mean, for this first, what we have presented now, we got very less uh, women respondent because everything was done by phone. So there was some danger, you know, we didn't know how was the situation on the ground. And we were thinking, okay, if we ask a woman to talk on the phone, maybe the husband will be jealous 
and maybe you know it can, it can increase the domestic violence. So during the first three weeks, we got very less women respondents. After the extension, we got many more women respondents. So that's why I'm able to answer about this question. Basically, uh, I mean, I, I totally got what the media are saying about domestic violence and all this. Uh, it seems, at least for the Anuman case, that it is less the case. Uh, simply because people do not have money to get drunk and beat a woman, it's sad that that's a positive as, uh, aspect same, of the ban. It's exactly the same in the refugee camp. So that kind of domestic violence linked to alcohol has decreased. You have tension, of course, because the couple stay in the same room during all day long uh, for two months. But basically, it's more about solidarity. Like Sanjana was saying, you know, we eat less, me and my husband, and we try to provide food for the children. So there are tension between the neighborhood because that one got uh, some ration for, from this NGO. That one got some transfer, some money from this guy. So there are some tension between the neighborhood, but within the, the household, it's, I, of course, <laughs> I was not physically there, but it seems, according to the woman that we got on the phone, that it was more or less relatively peaceful now. And I think it's because there was no alcohol. I think to also the refugee camp. Yeah, I, I just wanted to move to some questions that are posed to both of you. And some of them are comparative in nature. The first is methodological about accessing respondents during the lockdown. So how have you been able to overcome boundaries to data collection in the lockdown? The question is from Ankur. Uh, and uh, what is the tension between temporary conditions uh, which threaten to become you sort of over longer duration? Um, and what does this do to people's sense of belonging in the city? And uh, a related question to this is, uh, you know, the, the lockdown started out as something provisional, but then became very prolonged and protracted. And how did people reflect on this, uh, you know, temporary, permanent, uh, uncertainty, precarity kind of situation uh, from both sides? Hmm. So, uh, so these were the sort of questions. And then a follow-up question on that was really about, um, so, so what are the perceptions of the state and the, the that that sort of, have come out of this experience mm. and uh, how do people, I mean, what, how do people talk about asserting themselves or belonging in this mm. particular situation? So mm. there's sort of three questions, one about method and two more about um, the lockdown experience and the relationship with the state. Okay, about the methodology question, methodological question, as I mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, these two case studies are very well known to us. Uh, I've been working on Anuman Mandir since maybe the last three years, maybe more than that. And, and I've been working on Kilputu since 2010. So which means that we have already good relay. We have, we have already established good relation. My phone was full of number and people begin to talk me, to call me after the lockdown. So after there was this ethical question, what do we do now? Do we do, do as a researcher, what should we do? So we wait a few days and then uh, with Shankar Goda, my colleague, with Anthony and the other Anthony, we have decided to launch this uh, interview and we were very surprised of the response, positive response of the inhabitants because these people are like you and me, that stay at home and the first three weeks, they didn't know what to do. I mean, except eating, what are you doing during the lockdown? So they were- It's over the phone exclusively, Remy. That's yes, exactly. over the phone exclusively. Exactly. Nobody was allowed to go out or go inside anywhere at the beginning. And me, I've been locked down in Pondicherry. Uh, Shankar was in Bangalore. Anthony was there. You know I mean? So, you know, we did everything by phone, but I've been very, so I got this ethical question as a researcher, what should we do? The first three weeks, we have decided to launch this uh, phone interview. Then very quickly, we understood, so it was not only in on my case, I was also trying to work in and another uh, slum, Madame Porcadar, in, uh, which is also in Delhi. Very quickly, we understood that, okay, people are in need also. So that's why we began to establish some list of non ration card holders and we are giving it to uh, uh, NGOs. But after the first extension of the lockdown, we still are you know, doing this survey. But on my case, with Shankar, because the situation is very catastrophic in Anuman Mandir, we are more helping the people and then getting information. Basically, we are transferring cash 
large to them that fair like almost two lakhs of rupees in the beginning of the first extension to around like 67 families now. So that's what we are, our time is dedicated to that. So we don't use anymore this uh, interviews, but we are still keeping, you know, when people are talking, explaining why do they need the money. Uh, so we, we got, it's an ongoing, ongoing survey, but it's not at all the same as the first beginning of the survey. You want to say something? Okay. <laughs> yeah, we are about the yeah. We're about, yeah. Go on, Remy. Okay, and about the tension between temporary and permanent, so that's a very interesting question because in the case of Anthony, it's an habit. It's an habit, and it's there in the margin, permanently in the margin. And so the lockdown, it's the and, and, the, and the waiting process is their life. They wait. They used to wait used in to the wait. vegetarian. In the slum, it's not the case. And they are, of course, they are excluded, they are relegated to the margin, but they were really thinking that this lockdown situation will be temporary. And it was, they were really deeply believing the state. When the state stay at the beginning, it's only for 21 days. After the, sorry. No, it's okay. And there is also another uh, point. There is a big difference between uh, what happened in Anuman Mandir now and what happened in uh, Kilputu Batu now, because in the southern, in, uh, in the Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry, there is a re relaxation of the lockdown. Now most of the uh, refugees are going outside the camp and they are going to work. So it's quite different. And they are beginning to work also in Anuman Mandir. Mandir. Okay. But the, in Anuman Mandir, people begin, were really under shock after the first extension of the lockdown. After the 21st day, they were really under shock that this is getting extended. They were not believing it. That's why the, this food distribution with Chintan became a riot because people were like, getting mad. After the second extension, they begin to lose hope. And now, even if there are some relaxation now happening on the ground in Delhi, and you know, it's, it's not as strict as it was at the beginning of the lockdown, people are losing hope, and you have people who are trying to go back to Uttar Pradesh now. Of course, the ones who are living now, they are living in UP because they can't do it by work. You know, most of them, you know, they have finished to uh, spend all the little savings that they earned during March. Everything had been eaten in April. In May, they do not have any more money. They are trying to go back to work, but mates, you know, in Sardarjan and Cape, some, some mates are working in Sardarjan and Cape, which is a containment zone. We have some cases, and they cannot go back there. And the landlords are all afraid, you know, to have a stranger which potentially has a virus. And so they are like, they are completely losing up. So it leads to the last question about the perception of the state. It's very interesting and it was, I mean, it was very strange to me. At the beginning of the survey, people were really supporting the lockdown. They were really believing, you know, that drinking was, the prime minister was saying, okay, this is good, this is for you, this is to protect you. This is true for the slum dwellers. It was also true for the other interview we have done out of the slum in, uh, industries in Delhi. And, and the situation was the same in Kibbutz. was the same. So poor people were really, you know, getting into it like okay this is for us this is to protect us then slowly slowly they begin to realize that okay but the virus might be there but we will die because and the state has not think about us they are not you no know, supporting us they are not thinking that okay well how do we eat simply how do we eat the system is not functioning so after the first extension as i told they begin to lose faith in the trust the second extension they begin to lose hope in life and now third extension they just want to leave escape of not all of them but for people who can afford when they are living in Bijnor and next UP they want to go back they do not believe anymore into the state when the state is saying okay now it's getting relaxed don't worry you can stay no no <laughs> they do not believe in you they do not get it anymore so that completely lose the faith in the citizenship for them they are being completely they are mistrusting now the discourse of the prime minister they have been no, they, yeah, they did not get it anymore. So, follow up to that are two questions. Um, um, I mean, on on this issue of of state, but moving slightly towards the politics of it, there's one question. I think earlier on, Marielin asked about what is the presence of elected representatives, and have you seen? I mean, what did they really do during this, and what was their role? And Ratula has a question about the possibilities of political mobilization, and this was also something that I found very interesting that you sort of bring the rights discourse uh, very much into your writing. 
building and your presentation today um, um, you know you talk about the right to the city but how do that how are those rights asserted is there a possibility of political mobilization and ratula also adds is there a difference between how this would happen in the camp and the slum because mm -hmm. there i think there's a good also solid uh, comparison to be made. so just to reply quickly to the first question about the role of the political leaders and mla um, so people are saying that the mla is not doing anything it's uh, half true because uh, Ramadmi uh, party in Delhi, you know, with uh, Dilip Pandey, has set up some uh, emergency uh, scheme and emergency food distribution. But so basically, uh, the MLA is supposed to get some list of non-PDS uh, beneficiary families, uh, give them to Dilip Pandey, and they get some food, they get some letter, and they can go to the relief center to get the food. So, but the MLA in in uh, Arte Forum, and people <laughs> on, the f on the ground are saying, okay, he's getting useless. Uh, we are not getting anything from him. They are basically uh, completely lose the faith you know, with the elected representative because they are not seeing any results. Um, you go to community kitchen, it's good. The sense to that you are, we are not dying of food, but we are losing our dignity by going there. The MLA is useless. He told me that he will uh, help us, but he is not helping us. The list, um, and I mean, Krapatel is giving some list, but she, um, she's not acting on the ground. People are asking simply to get some dry Russian kit for one month. You know, they, they are not homeless people. They have a home, that they, they have a family, and this, they are not getting the minimal, minimal amount of food to feed their family, and the MLA is useless for that. So only the Pradans, in a, Pradan, in a sense, are a little bit more respected on the ground because they can see some direct benefit if they approach the Pradhan, you know, the Pradhan can link them to some NGO or some you know, other uh, solution to get them some dry Russian kit. Uh, the question of Fatula is very interesting because yeah, there are two different situations here also in terms of resistance and right to the city. In the case of Anuman Mandir Slam, the political mobilization is very less because the basic rights of these people are not getting fulfilled. It's difficult to get mobilized when you don't have a proper household. It's difficult to get mobilized when you have an empty stomach. It's difficult to get mobilized when your basic rights are not yet fulfilled, you know? uh, which is not the case in the refugee camp. No, no, but in the refugee camp, they can't be politically mobilized because uh, they okay. can't. They can't. They can't. Okay. Yeah, because the camp is monitored by the Q branch police. So it's a special uh, police branch dedicated to monitoring uh, mm. the people who were involved in terrorism, such as the Sri Lankan Tamil refugees. They, most, most of them uh, are helping, uh, are helped, sorry, by, uh, by, C, by the party of Siman. It's a very marginal party linked to uh, the Tamil nationalist movement. So, because NGOs are not allowed to go enter the camp, but some of them are helping uh, the people. Uh, who are sitting in the camp, and uh, most of these organizations are linked to Nam Tamila Kachi, the uh, party funded by Siman. Yeah. But there are two figures who are very important in the camp. This is uh, camp, the head of the camp. The head of the camp is uh, elected by the member of the camp committee, who are all from, who are coming all from the Sri Lankan Tamil community. Could and you the, a little bit closer to the microphone? I think something. Uh, yes. Voice is a Two big. figures are very important in the, in the really the Sri Lankan Tamil refugee situation. Two figures are very important: the head of the camp, which is part of the Sri Lankan Tamil community, and the camp manager. Usually, camp manager is not part of the Sri Lankan Tamil community and is a, usually a civil civil servant, which is in relation with MLA and so on. That's why, if they need something, usually they ask to the head of the camp. Who will ask after to the camp manager? And maybe the camp manager could do something for them. But most of them are not politically engaged because, uh, or if they are politically engaged, it's, it's totally hidden because some of them are also linked to the Elam uh, political mobilization. So it's totally hidden. They don't want to speak about their political mobilization, clearly. Thanks. This, this actually also brings me to a question that I had about surveillance. You write about it in your paper. Um, uh, this, this question of the police and how, uh, you know, the 
especially in the camp they are i mean there is a police presence and they are near the police post and there is this constant surveillance but in hanuman uh, mandir uh, in, in the settlement was this experience of lockdown which was enforced in this way a new thing this kind of surveillance and this constant interaction with the police did they experience it as that because i'm sort of bringing in a lot of stories that the poor experienced the lockdown in a slightly more violent way than the rest of us so just wanted to bring that there uh, in also that's also a nice and i mean an interesting comparison between both your sites because their relationship with surveillance is already very different to start with and then the lockdown happens so in anuman mandir people uh, did tell a story about the violence of the police they were very afraid of the lati they were not going out and uh, except to go maybe to one small market just next to anuman mandir the, the slum is just in front of the police station in arkepuram so they were in very uh, delicate position to go out but there are some art of resistance so it's not political mobilization but there are everyday kind of small resistance at the beginning some white speakers were going out very early in the morning before the over being touched by the being caught by the police sorry as they were trying to collect uh, waste but some people got beaten uh, so during the first three weeks they were not uh, you know really uh, trying anymore to go out. then after the first extension people begin to go out very early in the morning so now most of the west keepers are going out as a way to resist the point is that they cannot sell the collect the material that they've collected because nobody is buying it anymore because the industries were second industry are not functioning so that's also a problem you have people sleeping on the waste they have collected <laughs> that they put in front of their house they're sleeping on it and it's for 5000 you know of carton and plastic they don't want to use it but the police is very, has been very very violent with them and inside the camp also you got some tension there is a story of one guy one vegetable seller who wanted to uh, sell vegetable inside the camp he has been beaten up and by the slum dwellers because they were afraid of him to get you know, spread the virus this is what just at the beginning of the um, lockdown but yes the violence is, I mean, has been there and people were very afraid very very afraid to, to get out that's also a difference when you are living in a slum rather than living in a middle class neighborhood my friends you know starts Uh, and some other and care were able to go out and you know have a little walk in the park here and there these people were not allowed so can you imagine all day long along this smelly mala and now it's 40 degree under the sun and this is not so in the people like you and me it's like it's, the violence has been is not only physically but it's also very uh, symbolic you know? can i uh, there were there were a couple of questions that more towards the economic side of things so chloe is asking about the consequences on the economic circuit so basically who's managing the garbage who's doing the work that the essential work that these people who were into lockdown uh, was would otherwise doing and similarly were there such consequences in in tamil nadu on any of the economic activities that the refugees were participating in and mariel and has a question about those who had slightly more permanent jobs did they get salaries uh, mm. during uh, the lockdown period from their employers so i can answer to this question first so most of the people completely lost their salary even if it was you know a, Was, I, I don't think it was mandatory, but it has been advised to the employers to keep paying the salary of their employees. Most of the story we got that okay, he gave me two thousand and he asked me to go and leave. But it is true that it is different for some maid, for example, working in this farm here and there in Ekepura and Sardarjan around the stem. Then the people, uh, the middle class people, have keep giving them a salary to help them. So you have few households, you know, who still got their money from their uh, employers. In terms of Kabarivala, we're speaking. You have also people who got this, this advance, you know. So it's not a black and white situation. You got also some kind of solidarity which has emerged between the middle class neighborhood and the slum, and also within the slum, you know, people who can afford they give a little bit of money. Sanjana actually has been helped from her town. Uh, auntie which is living in Ravidas camp at the beginning of the lockdown she got four kg of rice that she uh, that auntie got through the pds they gave back to some you know you got also some solidarity but basically like 80% of the employers they just left their employees without 
and just with 2,000 rupees and now we go. How about the garbage, the question of uh, fuel, it's very interesting. So I'm getting the data, the everyday data from the municipality. So I have not presented it here, maybe I'll data of the waste which has been collected by the municipality going to the landfill, waste which has been collected by the municipality going to the incineration. And basically before the lockdown, everything was going to the landfill and very less was going to the incineration. Why? Because these waste pickers were working and they were collecting dry, uh, with, uh, dry waste with high calorific cal value. So it's a paper, you know, plastic, which is burning very well in the incineration as a value. So they were capturing this in order to uh, receiving it for the recycling industries. And you can clearly see it in the figures that I have compiled. On the first day of the lockdown, and one day after the lockdown, you can see that suddenly the incineration is rising up and the landfilling is going down. For the, for the first time since 2008 and following this, the two curves are completely different. More incineration, why? Because at the beginning of the lockdown, waste pickers were not at all allowed to collect the waste. So the incinerate, incineration scheme in, um, again, sorry, in, uh, in uh, Okia was working like full power. Then after the two curves are going back more or less to normal, even if, if incineration is much more important. What does it mean? It means that after a few weeks of lockdown, waste picking is again on the street, but now this, we will see the effect later on, but it seems to me that this lockdown has been an opportunity for the municipality to, you know, <laughs> to do this waste collection and to grab the high calorific waste that they could not get before. So we'll see that before, um, after a few weeks, what will uh, happen. In terms of industry, uh, recycling industries, so as far as we know, uh, it's, it's not working. The people are, I mean, the industry is not functioning again. So when you collect waste, you cannot resell it to the Cabarivala because the Cabarivala cannot resell it to the industry. So it's, it's still in standby for the moment. It's still in standby. All right. And yeah, do you want to say, Anthony, something on the, on the refugee camp, on the economic question? So they, they, do not they, they do not work in agriculture uh, because regarding the question of Chloe on the harvest in Tamil Nadu, they are not employed in agriculture. They are employed in, uh, as carpenters in buildings, constructions. And uh, from June to October, they are employed in the fishing arbor in Pondicherry just to uh, load and unload uh, the fish on the trucks after agreeing in Kerala. So uh, they are not employed in agriculture. Sorry, I can give a proper answer to the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so I think we've mostly covered it. There were some questions about um, the difficulties of getting ration cards in Delhi and things like that. Like, you know, we're talking about people who don't really want to go home as their first option, but yet they don't have ration cards in Delhi. And so there were some questions about that. I'm not sure uh, whether those are questions that can be very precisely answered. If you could try, Remy. But I think this last question we could take and, and, and uh, the government response. I mean, how can conditions be um, improved financially and in terms of hygiene in these kind of locations? Is this, there's been a lot of discussion about this, you know, about informal settlements and poor services and the situation of public health. So any, any, any thoughts on this in general? And Marie-Ellen has, has a Foucauldian question that, uh, that you guys can choose to answer as well. So I'm uh, leaving use, it to you. Yeah. I, I, use, I use Foucault just uh, regarding uh, what we call device or dispositive. I don't know how to translate device. Uh, I, uh, I don't know how to translate dispositive and device. I don't know if it's a proper uh, translation or not. Tools. I'm not sure. It's linked also to of the of the uh, it's linked also to the question of governmentality of uh, the power is important also uh, in this question. There was a question regarding the state, but but we have to uh, to do more uh, field work regarding this question regarding the rights through the city and regarding rights in the city. Maria oh, okay. is offering a critique. Yes, Maria. Yeah. I am going to unmute you. Hang on, wait. 
because mm-hmm. it's best she asks this in her own uh... go ahead i've unmuted you if i can ask in my own jargon yes yes absolutely i i think uh, uh, i understand what you're trying to say by saying that this is a governing technologies that is used but in some sense the lockdown is a governing technology that has been imposed on everybody uh, for the first time the poor and the non poor so if you use it to argue that there is a large injustice etc of course there are deep inequalities but i want to hear it from the interviewees did they use the uh, language of justice in the way they talk to you because of course there is injustice and inequalities in treatment and we agree on that but do they perceive it like this because as you said in the beginning they tend to accept the lockdown thinking that it was also for them so do they actually use that framework of justice or not no they in, in, uh, regarding the situation the uh, refugees they do not use this framework of course they have not read fuku but they can say it's not fair it's much tougher for us than it is for the yeah. others so that, so at the beginning of the lockdown they were really supporting the idea of the lockdown to protect themselves i mean they were believing the state but after two weeks of lockdown two weeks in anger fighting every day to to feed their children they are talking about injustice so they are realizing that this lockdown has not been positive at all for them and that's why i think that it is justified for us as researcher to mm-hmm. use this framework because I and mean, that's my position and I, I agree that everybody can disagree with me but i really think that this lockdown strategy has been done thinking only about one segment of the population and denying the right of existence of the others people at the beginning were really drinking was uh, modi was saying but two months after they do not they do not get it anymore they begin to talk about dignity so that's that was very strange for me they talk about dignity we are losing our dignity when we are going to the community kitchen they talk about humiliation when they receive the food finally after two three days of struggle for with this e coupon this was I, we were not getting it at the beginning of the interview two months after we are getting that kind of force dignity humiliation it was not here before so that's why i think it's very justified to use this framework actually this lockdown is something very unjust and people begin to realize that even in the slum usually they just you know saying okay 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 we will do so we do everything so now they begin to realize no we are not winning anything actually. we are just losing and the virus is not coming in this time at least in anuman mandir so they do not see what are really the benefits oh well, that's no, right it's a, it's a it's a perfect answer i wanted to know whether there was a reliance on this kind of terms in the narratives that you heard and yeah. so it is there and i understand it yeah, yeah. yeah. Add, add, I mean, sorry i just wanted to add to that from sort of the work that we've done in in gurgaon as well in fact what i found most interesting was this sort of uh, uh, you know how the narrative has shifted as subsequent i mean and as the lockdown has continued to extend but what has also happened is more and more people coming into this precarious bracket Uh, asking for food depending on handouts uh, people who've never so we we have a helpline civil society helpline which which sort of we are collecting data from in in gurgaon in the ncr area and we're actually getting calls saying that we've never had to ask anybody for anything before and these are usually people whom you would uh, economically classify in the middle class and not among the poor so people who own small businesses etc so the the extension of the lockdown is really bringing i think new questions uh, to the table which which is also something that's i mean that's also interesting that could be analyzed and and, and written about as we go along um should we stop here because i think we've covered a lot of ground uh and i'd like to thank both our speakers today for a very timely and very uh um uh, um uh, grounded uh intervention i mean something that 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 really speaks in the in the language of the people that uh, are experiencing the lockdown in this in this uh, way so thank you very much uh, uh the recording will be on the cpr website soon thank maybe so to send shankar goda because i saw that he is connected and uh, anthony raj anthony raj because i was the one who were doing the 
telephonic alloy which is tough, especially yeah. now with some car is a little gola, is a little bit depressed to get so many calls. So uh, thank you also to Shankar. Without him, it would have not been possible. And, and thank you, Anthony Raj. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone who came and engaged. And uh, we will, as promised, share this. And the Facebook Live is also available if you want to go over and, and look at some part. I have to say we missed the first few minutes in the Facebook Live because of some delay in it starting. But it's there for you to see. Uh, thank you for coming and we'll uh, get back to you with the details of the next webinar so bye thank you bye social distancing tu peux les on peut les copier les questions c'est possible essayer des questions c'est vraiment intéressant on va soutenir d'ailleurs mais c'est vrai qu'on peut creuser sur la question